Earlier this week, Americans observed Martin Luther King Day, which was established in 1986 to recognize the contributions of that indispensable civil rights leader. But did you know that since 2015, Canada has had its own day to celebrate the achievements of one of its great black historic figures? Every January 21st, we remember Lincoln Alexander, Canada's first black MP, first black cabinet minister, and the first black lieutenant governor anywhere in Canada. And we should particularly do so today because it is the 100th anniversary of the birth of Lincoln Alexander, who died 10 years ago. Let's remember Link, as everyone called him, with someone who knew him very well. Here's Canada's ambassador to the United Nations, Bob Ray, who joins us now from Manhattan in New York. Uh, Ambassador Ray, I want to take you back to the late 1970s when the two of you were members of parliament at the same time for a couple of years. He was a Tory. You were a New Democrat. Did you get much of a chance at that time to get to know him? Absolutely. He could not have been more um, friendly. It's hard to recreate those days, uh, Steve. But when I gave my first speech in the House of Commons, there were a group of uh, conservative MPs and we were sitting next to them. Um, front benchers, all of them, Steve Poprosky, who's used to be a great football player, Ray Natitian, who also became the, the governor general and Lincoln Alexander. They were like a kind of a, a heckling, a heckling team. It was sort of like a hazing ritual, you know, <laughs> that I had to go through. And, uh, initially I was quite sort of put off by it. And then, uh, and then I started to relax and have some fun with them. They had some fun with me. And, and afterwards, and again, this shows, I think, how uh, things have gone, gone awry in, in our political life. Um, we, you know, we, we went out for dinner together, and uh, th three, three really wonderful people. Um, Lincoln had uh, knew my dad a bit, and he, in fact, he'd just been down uh, at the UN and saw my dad there, and he wanted to he wanted to make sure I knew about that. Um, and and we struck up a real friendship. So. Uh, it lasted for uh, until he died. I mean, it was it was we we didn't agree on everything. He was a I mean, he was a real conservative. He was a um, a, a, a Diefenbaker guy uh, who was very loyal to the chief, um, but also very open. And as as time went on, uh, I found that I guess it's because I got to know him better. But uh, I can remember being with him when he was LG, and he he. We, we, we were at Harvard Collegiate um, uh, putting a, a memory capsule under a tree uh, on the occasion of an anniversary at Harvard. At Harvard. Um, and um, it, it was quite sobering for me because, I mean, Link gave a speech and after Link's speech, there was no point in anybody else trying to, <laughs> trying to convey a message. He had the students standing up. He had the students, you know, laughing, cheering. Uh, some of them were crying because he was talking about his childhood and he was talking about growing up as a black kid in Hamilton and and uh, how he learned how to, how, to, how to get along with people and he also learned how to fight for himself. Yeah, he did become a cabinet minister in Joe Clark's government in 1979, but only for a very short time because, of course, you helped defeat that government. And I wonder whether you've any felt whether you felt any guilt over the years at ending his career in cabinet prematurely. Well, you know, we, we used to joke about that too because he he, uh, he he was not happy. I mean, no conservatives were happy with me for a very long time. Some of them still still aren't. Uh, but Link um, was, was found himself with more time on his hands, and uh, he was uh, he was appointed to the uh, to the Workers' Compensation Board by uh, Mr. Davis. Uh, where he you know, immediately established a, a line of communication with me and also with the with the workers, and then he went on from from there to uh, to become the, uh, the lieutenant governor. And so, uh, you know, whenever he would say something about, and he did, you know, in in the speech that he gave at my swearing in ceremony, he he made a point of of of, of referring to that fact how I'd cut his I'd cut his career short. But I said, well, no, actually, I opened it up for you. I mean, you you might still be buried in the back benches in Ottawa. You would, you know, you're not going to be a cabinet minister forever. And, Do you remember uh, what he said on that day, October 6, 1990? Do you remember exactly yeah. what he said? I sure do. He said, do I? He said, somebody said to him, do you know the premier? He says, do I know the premier? <laughs> do 
I know the premier? Let me tell you about this. <laughs> He's, uh, oh, we had a great, we had a lot of interests in common. We were both lovers of jazz. Um, I, I think Arlene and I have been to a couple of, when things were a little more open than they've been over the last few weeks, we went to uh, Birdland and uh, uh, heard Count Basie's uh, band. And I think, I think uh, Link would have liked that. We, we shared a love for Ella Fitzgerald. I remember when Ella, Ella performed at the Royal York Hotel and Link uh, and his lovely wife were there and, and, and Link said, what are you doing here? And I said, what do you mean, what am I doing here? I love Ella Fitzgerald. He said, what do you I mean? Really? And, and then he, he, was, he was kidding me, saying, say, yeah, you can do that? I mean, you get it? Yeah, I said, I can do that. I think she's the greatest, greatest singer of, of all time. And we, we just there were so many ways in which we, we got along. When he was LG, I used to meet with him quite a lot. I was, I guess, kind of old fashioned about that. I used to go and see the LG about once a week or once every two weeks. Um, and we would talk and we would we would talk about the province. We'd talk about the challenges that, you know, that, that I faced, that he faced. Uh, we, we talked about uh, what it's like to, you know, how governing is a, a lot different than being in opposition. And we both, you know, because he'd been there too. Uh, we, we, we shared a lot of thoughts about that. And he, he would give advice. It was always very candid, very direct and, and uh, very open, but he, he loved people and he, uh, he was very proud of his own fight. Uh, and he was proud. And I think as he got older, he got even prouder talking about what his fight was all about and, and what his life had been all about, what he was really committed to, what he really cared about. Um, I think when you, when I first met him, I saw him, um, you know, as, as more of a partisan conservative, um, cause he was very good in the house. He was quite famously, Sitting right across from Mr. Trudeau at a number, Mr. Trudeau Senior, in a number of moments, and, uh, uh, and ironically, what did Mr. you know, Trudeau they actually, Sr. tell him to do. Yes, yes, that's right, fuddle duddle, as they say. But uh, <laughs> he, 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 uh, he, and Mr. Trudeau actually had a had a relationship. Apart from that, that one episode, they they knew each other very well, and they they respected each other. Um, I, I think that as he, I think the LG position helped him to really see the role that he could play in bringing people together, and and what he could teach people about his own experiences in uh, in the black community and his experiences of of facing challenges and facing difficulties, facing prejudice, facing discrimination, uh, and and at the same time fighting uh, and and never giving up the fight. Uh, I do want I to pick up on that, if I, I can, Ambassador Ray, because we have a we have a little clip of him here talking about about those days and uh, and the issues around fighting discrimination that he faced. So let's play that clip, and then we'll come back and chat, Sheldon, if you would. People by the thousands come here every year, seeking justice, work, tolerance, and they get all of that, but it's not perfect. There are still some people who still look at people of color with some disdain and dislike and want to call them names and won't give them jobs, you know. But I think that we're very fortunate to be in Canada, the greatest country in the world, but it's not perfect. But show me a better country when it comes to race relations. Now, there's the sort of Martin Luther King approach to race relations, which is, you know, lead to demonstrations, huge demonstrations in the streets. But I don't think that was Lincoln Alexander's approach. How would you describe the way he did it? Well, Link became a lawyer in, in Hamilton. Um, he, uh, he opened up a practice. Um, I think practicing law in those days, in the 1950s you know, and 60s, uh, was, was a challenge uh, for him. Um, but I also think it, was, it, 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 it really drew, drew out the qualities in him which allowed him to get along with people, to, to, uh, to have friends of, of every color, of every race, in every part of the world. And, and frankly, he wanted to get along with, with people. He, he really did want to connect with um, the institutions of the country. Uh, and I think he wasn't a preacher, he was a lawyer. Uh, and, he, and he was also um, determined to do well in, uh, in, 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 in Canada. And, and to make good. Um, 
I, I don't think he ever did that at the expense of what he believed or of, of what he felt and how we needed to share it. And I think it, it's interesting because one of the things he credits Mr. Diefenbaker with, which I think is is, is important uh, for us to remember, is that uh, Diefenbaker himself felt that he was an outsider. He himself felt that he uh, that he was uh, coming coming at the establishment from another place. Uh, he wasn't uh, uh, white Anglo-Saxon. He wasn't from the the aristocracy or the upper class or anything. He was, uh, uh, you know, Deep was a lawyer on the prairies, and and uh, he is made people made fun of him because of his name. And I think he he connected with Canadians in an incredible way in 1958 when uh, when he when he won his huge majority. Now you can all talk about well what happened after that and you know other qualities and other limitations whatever, but that part of of what the Conservative Party you know was all about really appealed to, uh, to uh, to Link and and it, it's important to remember that Link was elected uh, at a time when it was not easy for Conservatives to get elected in in the cities because of Mr Trudeau's incredible appeal. He got uh, elected during Trudeau mania in 1968 as a Conservative in Hamilton. Exactly right. He was elected as a conservative in Hamilton, and he and he had a unique. I mean, he was a terrific politician. He built a coalition in his riding, his constituency. He he understood what you have to do to get not only elected but reelected and reelected. You've got to do your constituency work. You've got to build a team, and your in your around you. You've got to you've got to bring a lot of people on on board who are not necessarily supporters of your party. I mean, that's part of what really good MP is able to do is bring those people, bring those people in. And that's very much what, what Lincoln did. Ambassador Ray, we're really grateful you could spare some time for us to remember Lincoln Alexander on this, his 100th birthday. Thanks so much. Thank you. I love the guy. I really did. And I think a lot of, a lot of us in, in all parties loved him. He was, a, he was a great guy. Amen. And now for another perspective on Lincoln Alexander, we are delighted to be joined by his granddaughter, Erica Alexander, who joins us from Stony Creek, Ontario. That's part of Hamilton. Erica, it's great to see you again. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you, Steve, for having me today. It's a real pleasure. I'd like to start by asking you, when you were growing up in Hamilton and your grandpa was we know who, did you realize at that time what a big deal he was? Um, I really didn't as a child, you know, it was kind of the norm for me to uh, live within uh, my grandfather's um, spectrum of life, but I definitely realized that he was a big deal, probably during my time in elementary school when he would come visit, my grandmother would come visit the school during events or um, different ceremonies, and I would see the reaction that other kids and, and their parents would have towards my grandfather. So that kind of made me realize, yeah, he's kind of a big deal. He's somebody important. That first picture we saw, one, well, all right, let's do this one here. Who's in this picture here? That's him in the middle, obviously, and who else? That's my sister, Marissa, and myself. And uh, this was taken at Luna Station in Hamilton uh, many years ago for uh, a black tie event. Fantastic. And I wanted to show this one again, because is that you? That is me. I am just uh, probably within one years old there um, with my grandfather at our home in Stony Creek. And, you know, reading was a big thing for both of us. And I, it's one of my favorite photos of us. Indeed. Now, of course, I, I mean, I knew your grandfather well, but I knew him in a totally different way than you did. We talked a lot of politics when we saw each other. We talked a lot of jazz when we saw each other. Um, but I wonder whether he talked to you about, for example... 1968, when he won his first election and entered the House of Commons, and he's the only black face in that whole House of Commons. Did you talk about that with him? Um, we did, in a, in a way, um, kind of throughout life. He always uh, was very open about his experience and the journey that it took to uh, get to where he wanted to be. And I think the main thing he always translated was um, that he just worked really hard and he was very persistent and he stayed confident. And... Um, I think that was his main message. Um, as far as him being the first black uh, member of parliament, I mean, that was one of his proudest achievements. And that naturally was just uh, passed down to us. And um, we recognized the power in that. And, and he, him maybe being an exception at the time, but also opening um, the gate for, for many others to come after him. 
I always wondered, Erica, whether his example would prompt uh, either, you know, your dad or you to go into public life. And uh, so far, no, eh? <laughs> Um, well, I graduated also from McMaster, like my grandfather did, and we both uh, graduated um, in a political science degree. Um, earlier in my life, I've, I've focused more on um, the health spectrum and the, uh, the holistic world of health. Um, but also, since my grandfather's passed away, I've really um, taken on the uh, responsibility and representation for our family in regards to his legacy. So that is something that is um, opening up for me and um, currently doing a lot more public speaking and 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 going into that pathway into my life as we speak. So, Well, in terms of his legacy, I'm not sure he could have got a better shot in the arm than what Ryerson University did for him last year, which was to name the law school after him. How did that come about? Um, it's, it's something that we were involved with, uh, definitely in communication with Ryerson um, prior to them announcing the naming of the school. And they approached our family um, for the blessing to do so. And it's been really a, a wonderful journey with them. They're an awesome group of people that have been able to pull this off. And I hear really great things about the law school itself. So I know my grandfather would be um, very exceptionally proud that there is that this place is named after him. I think he would be so honored. I think you're so right about that because, of course, uh, he and I did talk from time to time about the difficulties of his trying to become a lawyer. This is, of course, many, many decades ago and how tough it would have been and the discrimination that he would have faced at the time in trying to yeah. get through law school and then get that first job and to imagine that there will be thousands and thousands of lawyers going forward, yeah. you know, with a piece of paper saying, I went to the Lincoln Alexander School of Law. Yeah. He'd have loved that, wouldn't he? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've told this uh, story before of my grandfather. Um, the reason why he chose to go into law is because when he graduated from McMaster, he had his degree and he went out into the, you know, the work world to try and find work. And um, he was discriminated against because of the color of his skin. And he wasn't offered the opportunities that he sought after. And that kind of um, pushed him to want to go into law so that he could kind of create his own space and and it wasn't easy. And even when he graduated from law, it still kind of was the same, the same experience for him until he met his uh, future law partner, Jack Miller. And they really created a, a, a wonderful firm that that's still in existence to today. Mm -hmm. Now, having said all that, Erica, I mean, you think about it, you know, given that he was a man who was born in 1922, he became a member of parliament. He became a cabinet minister. He became the lieutenant governor of Ontario. I mean, he did some pretty cool things in his life. So yeah. I, I know he loved Canada as well, right? He did. He yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that was that was part of his uh, push to to accomplish the things that he did. He saw what this country was able to offer him, and even with the discrimination and and obstacles to face, he really had his heart in this country. And I think that's what set him apart from a lot of leaders even today is he just, he, he solely was um, concerned about people's ability to have the best life that they could. And I think that was the example that he led in his own life. He just, you know, his heart was always in it. Mm -hmm. I, I guess just finally, I want to know, uh, this is the hundredth anniversary of his birth. What's your family going to do? I presume something special to mark the occasion. <laughs> Yeah, we'll definitely be celebrating um, this weekend and on Friday. There's a, a bunch of virtual events. Um, we have the Lincoln Alexander Awards with Queen's Park on Friday and also Ryerson University doing their tribute to my grandfather as well. And the Raptors are also doing a tribute on Friday evening for my grandfather. So that's kind of how we're going to celebrate on Friday and then probably do a little bit something more personal on the weekend just to celebrate his life and remember him and, and enjoy some memories. Awesome. Erica Alexander, granddaughter of the great Lincoln Alexander. It's so nice of you to spend some time with us on TVO tonight to remember your grandpa. Thank you so much, Erica. Thank you, Steve. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.